Greetings, everybody, and welcome again to our Berean Bible Study. I'm your host, Granville McKenzie, and we are about to start an exciting new series of lessons. I'm excited about it because it's something I have really felt for some time that I, I needed to do and, and would like to do, uh, just to have a bit of a, uh, a compendium of of uh, what I'll call Bible basics. Now, um, over the years, there are some structured courses that I have taught, the main one being a course called Search for Truth. And, and I really, really enjoy teaching that and have done so for many years. Um, it is a 12-week uh, course, I believe, 10 or 12 weeks, I've never, ever been able to teach it that quickly. It usually ends up being somewhere around uh, 20 or 25 lessons. And uh, of course, that is totally dependent on the student. But most folks, uh, when they start to really get into the Bible, it is so fascinating. It's like, slow down, we want to take this in. So I'm anticipating that this series will be 20, 24 lessons, somewhere there. And, and I'm anticipating that we are going to have a phenomenal time um, discovering things in the Word of God that we may not have uh, seen or known or cons uh, considered uh, previously. And, and so <clears throat> tonight I'm going to begin at the beginning. It's a good place to begin. And so uh, if you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, we will begin there, and we want to talk about God and creation tonight, and certainly the early days of human history. We'll just see how far we get. Uh, it is always good for us to begin our Bible studies with prayer, because we definitely uh, would like the Spirit of God to, to teach us. That is His role, to be our our teacher, to bring things to our remembrance after we have learned that we can share with others and, of course, bring back to our own minds for our own benefit. So please join me as we open in prayer. And Father, we thank you for this day, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And as we are embarking on this new series of lessons, I pray that you will uh, certainly help me to have a clear mind and, uh, and the heart uh, to, to teach and to, to give whatever you have um, placed in my heart to share it with those who uh, may, may uh, be a part of this group. I pray, Lord, that you will give uh, attentive ears to each of us who are participating, and as questions and comments come from them, that will just enhance our learning and enhance uh, our time together with your word. And so I pray, Lord God, that you will open yourself to us, reveal yourself to us as we open our hearts to you and ask you to be with us as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we'll start with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And we will stop at verse 1 because... Uh, that verse alone will give us uh, a lot of things that we need to uh, discuss before we go any uh, farther forward. Uh, verse 1 of Genesis says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so uh, the, the first thing that sort of jumps to mind is this whole thing of God. Um, and so tonight, again, I don't know just how far we will get, but there are a couple of main points I would like to get across and, and uh, have us discuss. One is when we say God, what does that mean? Um, who are we talking about? What is our concept of God? What does the Bible have to tell us about God? And um, if we can get past that, I'll probably... It, uh, take some time to talk about the Word of God and to explain why it is we 
take the Bible as our scripture. And now, if we can establish who God is, uh, certainly to our uh, level of understanding, and understand what God's word is, and why we take the Bible to be God's word. If we can, can get those things nailed down, it will make the rest of our study a whole lot easier. Um, so I am not uh, going to try to give you convincing proofs at this point of God and his word. Why? Well, most people instinctively would say, yes, I believe in God. I believe there is a God. I believe there is a higher power. I believe there is a creator. <clears throat> and so, so that is uh, something that's commonly held by individuals. A lot of individuals, certainly those of you here or others who may uh, view this later, are interested in what we have to say because they do believe that the Bible is God's word. So I'm not going to try to give you an exhaustive exposition on God and his word, because I think many of us have already come to that place of understanding in our own hearts. But I do want to lay some things down as a foundation, especially for some who will be a viewing who, who do have questions, and, and this hopefully will help them to get moving in the right direction. Now, um, for some of you who are part of our Faith Sanctuary family, on the back of your bulletin every week, you will see um, a, a little section that's entitled Faith Foundations. And so uh, the first uh, couple of sections I will discuss, uh, you, will, you will find them on on the back of your bulletin under Faith Foundations. And as we go through uh, these lessons, I will touch on all of the things that are in that, that little uh, blurb, and, and you'll see how they all uh, come to pass. So the Faith Foundations is my little attempt to shrink the big Bible into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, short paragraphs and uh, certainly I don't think I've succeeded in bringing the Bible down to seven paragraphs, but, but there are scriptures there that will help you to get to where you need to go and, and open the door to, to greater learning and understanding. And so I'm going to start with paragraph one, which is uh, entitled God. And here's a statement that that you'll read there. We believe there is only one God, the eternal, holy, loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent spirit, creator of all. I'm going to read that again. We believe there is only one God, the eternal, holy, loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent spirit, creator of all. Now, um, I will take time and ask if you would help me with some reading. Um, uh, let's, let's just see here um, I, if I can recognize some of you folks who are here. I will just assign some uh, scriptures to you, and I hope I <laughs> can remember who I gave what scriptures to, but if not, then um, we'll just give it to someone else. So we're going to start with Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and um, Brother James, if you would be so kind uh, to find that for us, and I'm just going down the list as I have it um, here. Pastor Adrian, if you would be so kind, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Um, and uh, uh, Deanne, that's actually Deuteronomy 6 and 4 that I had mentioned. And so uh, thank you for 
I just print uh, printing those out for us in the chat. Yes, uh, first, that was an, an accident. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. First uh, Timothy one verse seventeen. That'll be Pastor Adrian, um, Brother Dean. I see you um, there. Leviticus nineteen verse two. If you would, Leviticus nineteen verse two, and um, Brother Amos uh, Findlater. First John four verse eight. Okay, first John four verse eight. Um, Sister Kim, uh, I don't know if it's Bob or Kim or both, but um, let's go, Sister Kim, if you could go please with Hebrews 4, verse 13, and Sister Celia, Revelation 19, verse 6. Revelation 19, verse 6, um, Claudia, um, Sister Claudia, Jeremiah 23, verse 24, um, Farheen, please, uh, John 4, verse 24, so uh, Farheen, that's uh, John 4, 24, um, Sister Heather, Isaiah 44, 24. And Sister K, uh, Colossians 1, 16. Now, um, okay, Sister Celia uh, won't be able to read. Which, which verse had we given to her, Sister Deanne? Uh, we'll, Revelation uh, 19, verse 6. Okay, so Sister Lucy, if you would, please. Revelation 19, verse 6. Okay, so if you remember the statement that was made, and um, fortunately, um, uh, this, this is something that you can go back to and, and go over this recording starting next week. So uh, if you don't have time or don't catch everything, you can start uh, making your own notes when we get back to it uh, or when it's broadcast next week. So whatever version of the Bible you may have is totally fine. Um, uh, they all pretty much say the, the same thing. So let's begin with Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, please. Deuteronomy 6 4, reading from the New King James Version. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so that addresses the point that we made that there's only one God, okay? Um, 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. New King James Version, 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so... We're talking about um, eternal, invisible. Um, uh, there's another term you might hear at times. It says incorporeal. <laughs> you know, a God is spirit. He doesn't have uh, flesh and bones and and all of that. He is um, uh, he is eternal. He is invisible. He is spirit and all the other things that were there. Clearly, it'll be important for all of us on, on our own time now to read through all of these scriptures just to, to get them uh, firmly in our uh, heads and hearts. But if you just take note as we go along, you'll have that handy. Um, and thank you, Deanne, for putting those in the chat. Uh, Le Leviticus 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregations of the Son of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Okay. <clears throat> so many of these words we read uh, require further um, definition and illumination, but holy is one of those words that applies to God. Essentially, it means set apart. And, and it is in the context of God, we just 
think about him really being set apart for good. We, when we think of the word holy, we're thinking of someone who, who does right, who is not uh, at all subject to the uh, sins and faults and failings that we are. He is holy. And, and so, again, you can carry on with other definitions as you have time to dig into that. But God is holy. God is perfect in all his doings. Uh, Leviticus, or uh, 1 John 4, verse 8, please. It's from the King James Version. In the New King James Version. Okay, you may be a little far from your mic, Brother Finlater. We're not hearing you. Let me just share. There we go. Okay. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Okay, so when we speak about God, we are speaking of the embodiment of love. And that uh, is a concept, again, that we will see playing out time and again as we go through Scripture. So God uh, doesn't just have love, but John is telling us that God is love critically important point. Hebrews 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay, so uh, all things are open uh, before his eyes. This is, this is a fancy word that you may hear called God's omniscience. God knows everything. He is omniscient. And so uh, that's, uh, that's what Hebrews is, is telling us about. This God we're dealing with, he knows everything. Um, that certainly tells us that it's pointless for us to try to hide anything from the God who knows everything. And again, this will become important to us as we go forward and see how people interact or interacted with this God, and how important it is for us to come before him with honesty and openness, because guess what? He knows it anyway. Um, Revelation 19.6, please. Revelation 19.6, NASB 2020. Mm -hmm. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. And so the key word there is almighty. And we have another fancy term for that, omnipotent. Um, potency talks about the ability to, to do, to, to produce. God is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. And so, so uh, Revela our Revelation is telling us about God's um, omnipotence. He has all power. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret place? So I shall not see him, say the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, say the Lord? So God fills heaven and earth. So what's the fancy term we have for that one? Somebody tell me. Omnipresent. God is omnipresent. He is present everywhere at all time. So he is incorporeal. He doesn't have, um, un until we start talking about the man, Christ Jesus, God doesn't have flesh and, and blood like we do. We are parked in one place. Uh, God is spirit. He fills the universe. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. This is uh, our understanding of who God is. He's omnipresent. And uh, what was that, Jeremiah? So um, 
Uh, John 4, verse 24, please. John 4, NASB 2020. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So God is not flesh and bones, as I was just mentioning, but he is spirit. Um, the, the, the whole concept of spirit is very interesting. We talk about people's spirit, uh, what kind of spirit they have. We talk about uh, the fact that this spirit thing really, I mean, uh, just, just emanates. We are here uh, together on this uh, Zoom call, but, but uh, some of you, uh, we, we look at the names, there are many of us who know each other. And even as we speak, we are interacting on a spiritual level, not just on a, well, we're not in interacting on a physical level, um, thanks to technology, uh, for those who have cameras on, we can see each other's faces. But beyond that, even when you hear someone's voice, right, we get an idea of what kind of spirit is in them that's motivating them. And so this spirit thing starts to get even beyond physical presence and starts to get into personality and and so it's important to know that God is spirit. And as time goes on, we will get to know a lot more about his personality. Uh, that was John 4. Uh, Isaiah 44, 24, please. New King James Version. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. So this now talks to us about God being our creator. Well, we read that right from Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so Isaiah uh, <laughs> continues on with this concept to present God as creator. Very important for us to know that uh, all things come from him. Uh, Colossians 1.16, please. New King James Version. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. So going beyond God just being the creator, now we see a description of the kind of creation that he does. He creates those things that are physical. He creates those things that are spiritual. He creates feelings, emotions, everything that is a reality in our universe was created by him. So, so you know, this, this even goes to one of these famous sayings by uh, Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Just this, this concept of, of thinking. Well, how does this, the mind work? I mean, we talk about the brain and we say, okay, somewhere in here, we've got a brain. But beyond the brain, there's this thing called the mind. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. Uh, we think, we emote, we, we have all this stuff going on. God created all of these things, visible, invisible, powers, dominions, thrones, thinking, imagination, uh, emotion, everything. God is the creator of all. So just to, to um, uh, wrap it up again in this, this opening sentence, we believe there's only one God, the eternal, holy, loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent spirit, creator of all. And, and these scriptures substantiate uh, the statement that I have just made. So any thoughts that anyone may have on this? I saw that comment that God is glorious and he most certainly is glorious. 
And these scriptures, as you go through them again, uh, will just help to round out our understanding of what we mean uh, when we say this simple three-letter uh, uh, word, God. So, any, any thoughts on this before we continue? Sister Deanne, go ahead. So, I, I like sci-fi, mm -hmm. and we use the term corporeal. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't remember how you pronounce it, but it, it's so interesting that I had an understanding of that in a scientific sense as it relates to all the scientific, you know, uh, shows that I watch, mm -hmm. but not in the concept of God, right? So mm -hmm. that connection was a, whoa, yes, that is so true. You know, whenever <laughs> they would encounter corporeal beings uh -huh. and because there's always some aliens you know thing coming at mm -hmm. the humans mm -hmm. um it's it's in spirit form right mm. so that's that's such an interesting that's a, a connection that i made with with the reading that we those those scriptures that we went through today yeah so we have um um corporeal corporeal however we pronounce it you're a teacher so i'll leave that to you to uh figure out all that uh, all the English. And then we have the word in corporeal. Uh, and, and that's where God is. Now, the, the, which means he, he's not physical that you can touch him. And one of the things with all of these, whether it's sci-fi or, or you know, cop shows or whatever, um, war, the whole thing is you're going to go against somebody and you're going to hurt them and you're going to kill them. Well, a lot of what we have in our entertainment now is beings that, that just jump and fly various places. You fire bullets and they stop bullets and matrix and all this stuff and nothing hurts anybody. And, and so I'm going like, okay, how do you kill them? Well, they are trying to combine the corporeal with the incorporeal and pardon my pronunciation um but god is incorporeal he is he is not um a visible as as such until we come all the way down to god being manifested in flesh god being made real and tangible in flesh in the person of jesus christ apart from that he's spirit he he is everywhere at all times um, he can be there and you don't know he can be there and you know he can be felt or he cannot be felt as he chooses um, and he can make himself real and obvious or he can be totally invisible but he's there so god is the ultimate um, um, uh, person uh, personality that that can do absolutely anything he wants be anywhere he wants to be and you can't touch him nothing you can do to him against him uh, to attack him uh, he's beyond all of that that's good so any any other comments about god because this of course is is a, a, a very very important concept we are talking about God, what we mean when we say God. So any other thoughts on that? Okay, so just uh, take some time, again, read through these scriptures, meditate on them. We are, uh, this is where we begin just to get a, a broad view of what we mean when we say God. So God uh, I, uh, so I, I will, uh, instead of just jumping into the creation side, I will jump into another uh, section, as I mentioned, that talks about God's word. This God, who we have just tried to define in a very incomplete way, <clears throat> uh, we say has spoken to us, has spoken to humanity. And we say, that he has spoken to us through his word, which we call the Bible or the Holy Scriptures. And, and so you might ask the question, well, sure, that's what you say, but why on earth 
should I accept the Bible as the word of God, just because you say it is? And, and so I'd like to just get into that for, uh, for a little while, because I would like you to understand why we actually devote ourselves to the Bible, as opposed to any other writing there might be in, in the world. And so the statement I would make on that is to say, we believe the Holy Scriptures, or the Bible, as we uh, otherwise call it, is God's true and complete word to humanity. We believe the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, is God's true and complete word to humanity, verified most notably through fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Now, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, the Bible is the word of God, and someone may well say, well, prove it. You know? <laughs> uh, why do you say it is the word of God? And we believe it is the word of God because it has been verified, most notably through fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Now, there are other things, but, but one of the things that is, is um, uh, as we read the Bible, we will see from, from these next few verses what the Bible actually says about itself. This is what we would call if we were you know, reading, uh, as we were reading a book, internal evidence. What does it say about itself? And, and so we look at that internal evidence, and then, of course, there are external evidences. But right now, we are going to go to the internal evidence. What is it in Scripture that it says uh, that, that gives us this level of, of confidence that we are reading the Word of God? So um, where shall I go? Let me continue on. Um, uh, Sister Bryce, if you can help us, um, I would ask you to turn to 2 Timothy 3.16, please. And Sister Mitzi, if you can please read 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. And uh, Nadine, please, Isaiah 41, 21 to 23. Nadine, Isaiah 41, 21 to 23. Um, Brother Owen, Isaiah 42, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 42, verses 8 and 9, for Brother Owen. Um, Sister Frederica, or whoever it may be from the Rainford household, uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. And uh, Brother Ron, Ward, uh, Luke 24, um, 25 to 27, Luke 24, 25 to 27, and finally, Sister Susan, uh, John 17, 17, John 17, 17. Okay, so now this is what the Bible has to say about itself, and this is the internal evidence that we have from Scripture that gives us confidence to say, yes, we are dealing with the Word of God. So let's go uh, with 2 Timothy 3.16, please. All Scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, so now this is the Bible's internal evidence. This is what it says about itself. Uh, the scripture is 
uh, given by God, and it has various purposes. Uh, can you read those again for us, Sister Bryce? The purposes. For Sorry, the word it of says, God. "All Scripture is given by by inspiration of God." Okay, and so is profitable it. for doctrine. For doctrine. For, uh, for okay, rules. slow down. So doctrine, that's just teaching, right? That's what doctrine means. Uh, for teaching, the next one? For reproof. So, so for reproof, um, there are things we might do in life that aren't right, and the Bible is there to codify right from wrong. Uh, next one? For correction. For correction, okay. What you are doing here is wrong. Here is the way you should go. Here is what is right. So it doesn't just leave us in condemnation for doing wrong, but it shows us the right way. Next one. For instruction in righteousness. So now uh, here is the way, the lifestyle we want you to live. I want you to live as God. Um, and so I will instruct you in righteousness. So that's what the word of God is for. And it's given by God's inspiration, which again speaks to us of the fact that we do have uh, this book we call the Bible, 66 books um, written by, now you'll tax my memory, 30-something uh, authors. And, and all of these men, uh, there, there were not female um, Bible writers, and many of you will understand that from the uh, sort of history of humanity and patriarchal uh, times. But, but these men were inspired by God to write these words, and, and we have seen the purpose of it, doctrine, reproof, uh, correction, instruction, in righteousness. Uh, thank you. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 20-21. Okay, I'm reading from the NSAB. 20. Yeah, but ahead. know this, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay, so... Uh, again, we're, we're seeing that, that everything we have here, the Bible is telling us about itself, that God is the one who brought this, these prophetic words, uh, gave them to these people, and there is nothing here that is just a matter of our personal interpretation. So we start to extrapolate from this that, that the same Spirit of God that moved and inspired these people to write is the same uh, uh, spirit that inhabits us, that helps us to interpret and understand what was written. And since it's one spirit, one teacher, we should come to one understanding. Now, we, we know uh, quite well that that does not happen at all times. And, and before we started our last series of lessons on the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we read 1 Corinthians 13, which explains to us that now we know in part, now we understand in part, we're seeing as it were through dark glasses. Uh, one day we will see uh, as things really are, um, but when we're dealing with an infinite God, as we have spoken about, an infinite mind, infinite knowledge, infinite intelligence. It is very, well, it's impossible <laughs> for a finite, tiny, microscopic beings like us to comprehend and understand the infinity uh, of God. So, so uh, the point is, there will be those who will be able to come together, discuss um, decipher, understand the Word of God. Uh, it should not be that, that there are a thousand people here with this understanding and uh, us alone on, on the other side. Uh, the same Spirit that inspired the Word gives us 
the um, understanding of the word. All right. Uh, now we are going to Isaiah 41, 21 to 23, please. I'm reading from the NIV. Okay. Present your case, saith the Lord. Set forth your arguments, saith Jacob's king. Tell us, you idols, what is going to happen? Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Hmm. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so we may know that, you're, that you are God's do something, whether good or bad, so that we will dismay and fill with fear. So now we are getting into uh, the next part of, of the internal evidence of scripture, which is that God is saying, okay, okay, here's the test. Um, I'm telling you, this is my word. Uh, I'm telling you that I'm speaking through my prophets. So here's the test. I'm going to tell you the future. I'm going to tell you what is going to happen. You do the same. Um, you tell us what's going to happen, and, and you, you bring that forward. Bring forth your strong arguments and, and declare what is going to take place. So God is saying, here's why I want you to believe me. Uh, I, the, one of the things about God is that God knows all. So if we follow our, our definition of God, and this, this is something that is common with uh, how many people conceive of their God, uh, they say, okay, fine. Um, I will show you that I'm real, I'm alive, and I actually know what's going on. I will tell you the future. You do the same, and if you can do that, that will prove that you are equal uh, to me, that you are God. Um, so he says in verse 23, declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. So this is God's test uh, and God's standard to other gods or whoever people may claim uh, their gods to be. You tell us the future and what is going to happen. All right. So, so that's, um, that's a powerful scripture where the Bible is telling us what it is we need to know and why we should accept this as the word of God. Uh, Isaiah 42 continues uh, with this, uh, verse 8 and 9, please. Who's got that one? Isaiah 42. Verse 8 and 9. Brother Owen, are you there? I was muted. I apologize for that. Yeah. I was reading away, but I was muted. <laughs> Apology accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. New King James Version, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So again, in the, this chapter, we have the same thing being presented. I'm the Lord. Uh, and of course, um, if you remember way back when we talked about Genesis 2, we see this whole thing of the name of the Lord, Yahweh Elohim, uh, from way back in the beginning, uh, God was presenting his, his name. I am the Lord. That's my name. I am Yahweh. I am Elohim. And, and, and uh, so that's me. The glory that accrues to God is, is mine. And uh, I am declaring new things to you before they spring forth. I proclaim them to you. So again, God throws out the challenge, throws down the gauntlet. If you want the title of God, you tell us what is going to happen in the future. Uh, let's go forward to Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, please. I'm reading from the NIV, um, verse 9. Remember the former things of those long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. 
I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So uh, again, we're dealing with what God is saying um, in his word, inspiring his prophets to say, and, and he is harping on this point. There's, and, and, and these things, if we see them and accept them, help us quickly to eliminate a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, there are times people uh, will, will say to me, well, uh, what about this religion or that religion or this uh, uh, religious book or that religious book? And frankly, I don't, I mean, I don't know what I would have to do to learn all of that. One of, uh, in fact, I have a, a book in my library, like literally this thick of uh, the world religions. I don't have the time, the smarts, um, the whatever, to accumulate all that knowledge. Here is why I don't spend time doing that. Because if I can establish that this book is the word of God, and as God is saying, I'm God, there is no other God. If we can establish through this that he is, in fact, the one and only God, we don't need to worry about any other. If we can uh, find reason to believe that there is uh, the one, the one who, who knows all the things past, but declares the end from the beginning, before it even began, he, he gave us the ending. If he is the one who is able to do that, he is the only God. Uh, unless some other God comes along that can do what he does, and he has thrown this challenge out, and no one has been able to come forward. I'm showing you from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established. Well, why can he say that? Because he's all powerful. My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. He is God. He knows all. He can do all. He will bring his will to pass. So those are three key passages from Isaiah uh, that, that uh, has God speaking to say, hey, this is me and I know what's going on, and if you want to compete with me, you tell us the future. Uh, then we jump to Luke 24, 25 to 27. And then he said to them, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to come into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So now, you know, there, there's always homework to do, right? Uh, if you have... Uh, an NASB um, study Bible. Some of this homework will be done for you, but um, the particular uh, Bible that I have uh, in verse 27, in the references for verse 27, it just starts to list a number of Old Testament scriptures uh, relating to Jesus coming and the New Testament fulfillment. It's, it's wonderful reading. Years ago, when I was a kid, the standard uh, reference Bible was called the Thompson Chain. Uh, anybody remember the Thompson Chain Bible? Um, man, when I was like 19, I bought my full leather uh, Thompson Chain for like $18. This was many years ago. And I still have it to this day. Um, it, it's, it's just just a treasure from my, my youth. And in the Thompson chain, it has a whole list of scriptures, Old Testament scriptures with New Testament uh, fulfillment. And 
and it's it's just a powerful tool. Certainly, you can do this online uh, whenever you have um, uh, a chance. Just to type prophecies concerning Jesus and and their fulfillment. This is the main thing that that uh, Scripture has done to give us this confidence that we are dealing with the Word of God and dealing with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and this is clearly what Jesus was trying to lay out to his disciples. This is after his resurrection, Luke 24, and, and he just wanted them to, to understand. As he said, guys, you are so foolish. Uh, you are slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It's not that it wasn't there and you didn't know it, but you've got to read it, understand it, believe it, and see that it's being brought to pass right before your very eyes. So this is God's way of saying, believe my word. I will tell you what's going to happen, and it's going to happen. And primarily, I'm going to tell you about my coming to earth as a man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and all of the prophecies concerning my life, death, burial, and resurrection, so you will know that I am God, and that this word I have given you and inspired my servants to write is the word of God. And when we can establish that, it eliminates, this is mutually exclusive, it eliminates all other sources or, or, or scriptures or holy books or other gods. And that is the purpose of, of what the scripture is saying about itself. It is purposely eliminating all other competitors. And, and so that is crucial. Last one we'll read is John 17, 17. John 17, 17, New King James Version. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so this final piece of, of the internal evidence from Scripture is the Lord saying, when you read my word, you're reading truth. <laughs> and so that's it. Um, we believe the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, is God's true and complete word to humanity, verified most notably through fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. And just in the interest of time and not um, extending the lesson beyond uh, where it, it should go, I, I um, will uh, leave it to you. If, if you uh, don't have a King Jane or a, uh, something like the Thompson Chain Bible, Sister Heather says she's got two, so you can uh, see if she'll lend you one. But it's, it's, a, it's an excellent project if you haven't done this before. See what the Old Testament says about Jesus, his coming, his, his birth, his life, his death, all of these things, his uh, glorification. And, and you will really start to say, wow, all of this was given by God beforehand so that we will believe that this is the word of God. So any thoughts you have? on that, the Word of God. Pastor Adrian. Uh, maybe just uh, a, a comment uh, for some of you who may have come across this and it may have come up. Um, that last scripture says, thy word is truth. There is another uh, scripture where truth is questioned, like what is truth? Mm -hmm. And an answer is not given by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And some people who don't know the whole extent of scripture uh, may, as some have done to me, say that uh, Jesus didn't know uh, everything because he couldn't mm -hmm. answer that question. But in John 18, 38, Pilate says, what is truth? And of mm -hmm. course, we've seen, uh, we've seen the response in the scripture that Sister Susan read. So I thought I would just point that out uh, really just out of interest in case yeah. um, it's of help to anybody. Uh, thank you. Um, this, this is not a unique uh, situation. You, know, uh, you read John 6, for example, 
and and Jesus is talking about people eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and the crowd scatters. Everybody leaves. He felt no uh, um, compulsion to to clear up their misunderstanding. You know, and time went by, and he sat with his uh, disciples for the Last Supper. He said, "Hey, this is my." Um, my body and this is my blood and then it, it clicked Pilate said what is truth jesus felt no uh, need to answer at that point later on after his resurrection he specifies uh, or or actually this is just before his crucifixion i should say he had already made this point your word is truth uh, brother dean i believe has his hand up has or had yeah, going back primarily to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, but certainly coming back to John 17, 17, I, uh, I'm just concerned about the word complete, which is um, used in our foundation. Um, mm -hmm. we do, I, I want to think that sometimes that God can speak in, in other vessels. I know you read a lot and many learned men read a lot, and I think that God can actually speak in other forms, given the fact that this is not, um, this is a Bible study, this mm -hmm. is not a study of another book or something mm -hmm. of that nature, but I like the fact that it says, sanctify them in truth, your word is truth, and you saying it's uh, internal. But so, I do think that God uh, one, one of, uh, that's, that's a, an excellent question, and um, I, I will just make a, a brief comment on this. Um, when we look at the Bible, this is what God has given to us. This certainly doesn't mean this is all there is that God has to say or has said or could say on any number of things. Obviously, he didn't address a lot of things in science and politics and education and uh, botany and uh, weather and all of that. He, he, he touches on the various things, but what he has given to us, uh, we have a term we call the canon, C-A-N-O-N. And uh, one of the interesting things is to see how, how the canon came to be. And in fact, how people recognized certain writings to be God's inspired word to humanity and so there are many legends that are there uh, one of them uh, certainly is that uh, as the the jews were trying to compile uh, the writings that they they could know and have confidence in that they were the word of god they got 70 uh, rabbis together and said okay you are learned men you give us a list, and we're talking about the Hebrew Bible now, which is not dealing with the, the New Testament, um, but uh, you, you sit down and write up the list of the books that you consider canonical, books that should be uh, accepted and taught and memorized and, and used as the Word of God. So uh, the legend is, and I, I have no idea how you know where the truth actually lies but the the legend is that all 70 of these men came up with exactly the same list and the book that came out of it was the the greek old testament called the septuagint um uh, of course uh, referring to to 70 so uh th there there was the the canon um, how they recognized the words of God uh, as opposed to other writings that people might have done, smart people, godly people. But, but there were certain tests, you know, the non-contradiction. You, if you read whatever you read in the Bible, it cannot contradict what is in some other part of the Bible. Of course, what uh, God had laid out here as far as prophetic fulfillment He's saying, if I put a word in the mouth of my prophets, it will come to pass. That's how you know it's the word of God. And to be frank, 
Uh, the Jews, although they hated many of these prophets, they were uh, faithful in preserving their words. And even though they hated uh, guys like Jeremiah, for example, man, they called him a traitor. They threw him in a well. They put him in stocks. They uh, did all sorts of things. They, they didn't like the man. But his word came to pass. They preserved his word and accepted it as the word of God. Um, so someone may say, uh, in challenging what I've said, that it is uh, God's true and complete word to humanity. Um, they might say, well, there's some other book that um, God delivered to somebody, but it, it's um, hidden somewhere and, and hasn't made it to scripture. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue the point, to be, to be frank. When I say complete, I certainly do say it from the standpoint that whatever it is God wants us to know about himself, about salvation, how we should live, where we came from, where we're going, is contained in his word. And, and certainly in that sense, it is complete and it is true. Let me stop there and uh, get Brother Ron uh, involved. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that I don't know about you, Pastor, or anybody else in the group, if they had anybody tell them that the uh, Old Testament is not as important as the New Testament. But this study tonight, to me, confirms that the Old Testament is probably more important because a lot of the things that are spoken about in the New Testament stems from the Old Testament. You know, that, that has been an ongoing uh, discussion among uh, many people in many groups. But the one thing that you can do is to track New Testament writers and see how often they bring stuff forward from the Old Testament. Um, at the time of this recording, it's uh, the day after Pentecost Sunday. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, and the people were saying, what's going on? Peter said, this is that. Well, what's that? That's Old Testament. That's yeah. Joel's prophecy. Yeah. And so uh, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he would say, you have heard it said, um, you know, love your friends, hate your enemies, sort of thing. But I say unto you, you have heard it said, uh, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, and he pulls from the Old Testament law, and, and he's constantly bringing this stuff forward. A book like uh, Hebrews, constantly bringing Old Testament forward as far as uh, temple worship and things of that nature. Um, a book like Matthew, which was written primarily to uh, a Hebrew audience, constantly pulling uh, forward from the Old Testament. The beginning of the book of Luke uh, basically takes the last verses of the book of Malachi and ports them into the first chapter of the book of Luke as far as um, God turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. So um, apart from the fact that four-fifths of our Bible is Old Testament, man, if you want to get rid of that, you're getting rid of the whole foundation of, of uh, Jesus' life, ministry, and New Testament uh, teaching. So we've got to have it all. It amen. is all critically important. Yes, amen. Anybody else? This is good. This is good. Okay. I don't see any other hands up right now or mics uh, open. So um, I, I'm going to wind up here for today because we have, we've hit two big topics that I wanted to cover and I don't think it would be good for me to try to uh, rush ahead into another big thing called creation. But I, I think I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. For those of you who 
are looking for something really good to read that will uh, blow your mind as far as how you can absolutely um, correlate the creation story we're going to talk about next time with science. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, book you can read. It's called The Genesis One Code by Daniel Friedman. Um, it's published by Inspired Books. It sounds like a private publisher, but, but this, this is a, a fantastic book. It actually uh, gives you calculations that rabbis and Kabbalah and all that uh, uh, Talmud, uh, uh, um, Midrash, and all, all, all kinds of uh, Jewish sources things that they have done that when, when they uh, work out all the, the details of what creation was all about, uh, the Bible and science are totally, totally in sync as far as the age of the earth, um, somewhere about uh, 13 um, uh, and a half billion years. Believe it or not, you can uh, get that when you do the math uh, using using scripture now uh, God uh, uh, God is amazing as you well know <laughs> and there are things hidden in his word that we don't often see uh, but but um, when we actually dig in and see what it is he's trying to tell us it's like wow um, so as we go through the creation story I'll I'll mention, a couple of points from this book. I'm not going to go into it in detail. It, it does take a little time and a little thinking, but, but um, we, we will uh, get into creation next week. Uh, Brother James. So because you opened the door, I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> sure. Um, if, if, and, and I, I believe that science agrees with God. But if that's the case, and, and we have books that tell us that, mm -hmm. why do we have such a, why is it promoted as science versus God, as opposed to science agrees with God? Yeah, uh, from the standpoint of creation, um, and I, I don't want to um, steal my own thunder uh, for next week. Uh, so, I, I think I will kind of leave that um, for next week, but part of the whole process uh, to, to sort of give it the spiritual side is that a lot of people who do not want to believe in God uh, would prefer to believe in science and something that they would think eliminates God and keeps it in a very humanistic way. So there are many who will do anything to try to avoid dealing with God and, and of course, um, will attack the things of God. But there are others, scientists, who say, hey, I am a believer. What I see leads me to God, and they have done work. Um, this gentleman is uh, Jewish, as you may uh, understand from his name, Friedman. But uh, he said, no, I... I, I believe the, the Torah, um, and I certainly don't think it would be at variance with science. And once he started doing the work, it's like, man, <laughs> the Bible is as up to date as one can imagine. But I, I think, Brother James, the thing is that there are some who absolutely do not want to, to um, accept scripture as being on par because there are other things that would bring up, like, I should obey the scripture. Uh, last word to Pastor Adrian tonight. Thank you, Pastor. I just thought I would I would uh, extend to an earlier point um, by saying that you know, so God knows all things; He knows everything. Of course, uh, we only know in part, and I think uh, our church certainly, uh, and and a number of Christian churches, uh, we we base our whole worldview not on what we don't know that God knows, 
but we base it on what we do know that God knows, which is his word given in the Bible. And I just like to, in, a, in, a, in the pluralistic world that we live in, uh, I think we get challenged by things that are outside of God's word. And, and uh, when they are at variance with God's word, um, that challenge becomes very real. And so I just wanted to read a scripture that I think gives an indication of, of the wisdom of actually taking the word of God as it is and remaining within con the confines of its, uh, of its borders. John 20 verse 30 says, um, this is talking about the purpose of John's gospel. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by leaving you may have life in his name. And so back to your comment about the completeness of scripture, um, it, it's not everything that God knows, but it is sufficient mm. for us to be able to live a successful life and to be saved. Yeah, and, and I, I think that that is uh, the point. Maybe I should have made it uh, clearer in, in my little blurb there, but when we speak of completeness, we have everything that God desires for us to have to be able to uh, live for him, obey him, uh, receive his salvation, and secure our future in his presence in heaven. Um, so, yeah, I, this, this, is, this is fascinating to me. We have just touched on, on a couple of points, and I certainly hope that you have enjoyed this as much as I have and that you may have picked up a point or two that you may not have considered before. And uh, God willing, next time we are going to get right into creation. And so until then, God be with you and have a wonderful week.